It's the easiest thing for you to do, to be too tired, to be too unalert, to be too unaware, to be too uneducated. And nobody cares about that because guess what? Christianity especially has been so marginalized in America, not by you, by the way. You didn't do it. It started with the media. It started with the government taking prayer out of school. It started with all this. So when you start to see how quickly erosion happens from the faith, from the faith of the founding fathers, from the Bible, that's a, that's a word of caution to say, check yourself. Check yourself, as Paul said, to see that you are still in the faith. We have spent weeks now investigating the rise, the emergence, the development of Judaism, and I'm, I'm hoping that all of that has become a little bit more clear. What has the conclusion been thus far through the letter of the Romans 9, chapters 9, 10, and 11, that God has a plan that although the Jews have rejected Christ, God will give them another opportunity when Christ returns. Now, before I get into the text of Romans, last week I was alluding to Paul's words of caution. He's in essence saying that we need to exercise caution as Gentile converts because it is that falling away uh, or complacency that happens so quickly. And usually it's something that's kind of like seeds that have been planted for a long time. You know, you've heard it, you've heard the example given here, long before the ice and the snow on a tree branch comes crashing down, there was a melting process from the deep freeze that could have taken days, weeks, who, who knows how long before the thing comes crashing down. So we have a very similar thing when we talk about complacency or people who are backsliding. It happens usually, the, the initial happening, and then there is a progression downward. So when I say we need to stay vigilant, that's not an understatement because we can look back into the book and see how quickly people can depart from the ways of God. If you take, for example, the churches of Asia Minor that Paul had journeyed to, some he established, some he did not, but anyway, he made the trip. Um, places that you would recognize from Scripture, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, Ephesus, Pergamum, and so on. Most of these would have been located in what is now modern-day Turkey. Okay, And here is what the tragedy is. If you know your history, that area was literally on fire. The gospel message, the good news, was spreading like wildfire through Asia Minor. Fast forward to the year 2022, and what was Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, is 99.8% Muslim. Did you hear that? That's to tell you, you might say, well, but okay, you're talking about somewhere in the ballpark of 1900 or some plus years. Yeah, but it started immediately. If you're reading this book, you can see how apostasy, complacency, and backsliding happened really, really fast. And in fact, if you are familiar with the landscape of Turkey, any church that used to be standing as a church has long been covered over and is a mosque. The church at North Africa. If you're even a little familiar with some of these names, Tertullian, Clement, Origen, probably the most well-known name, Augustine. Think about this. This is where all of the commentaries, all of the great thinking Christian minds in the early days, where is that church now? It's gone. So if you actually want to pinpoint a date, you've got to look back to about 638 AD when the Muslims took possession of Jerusalem. That basically began a cascade 
which if you know your history, it becomes a little bit like the last battle with the uh, Crusaders attempting to secure Jerusalem, but basically failed its surrender in 1291. And then ultimately the fall of Constantinople in 1453. All of these things matter because you, if you're looking at the world stage in history and specifically those adhering to Christianity, you are going to see a massive migration of people out of these areas. Why? Because for a time, Muslims actually lived peacefully for a time, especially at the time of Muhammad, when Muhammad was alive. Jews and Muslims actually li lived side by side. And believe it or not, Christians lived, they all kind of lived in their own little, call them cubby holes, and nobody cared. So what happened to these Christian churches. If you're looking in your Bible, and if you have a Bible like mine, you've got a map at the back. All of these churches in here, all of these churches that you would be familiar with, they're all gone. And if you've traveled to that land, you know, the only thing that remains, very little, if anything, of those particular churches. So the idea here is when, when we're looking at Romans and we're talking about the Jewish people and their rejection, I said last week we need to be very careful. A, to not judge those people. That's God's prerogative. It's his problem. He, he obviously knows what he's doing. But it's important for us to make sure, unlike the secular world that is trying to whitewash and revise its history. It's important for us to keep ourselves in check with history. You see, if you are even a little bit familiar with church history, you've got the, the chronicle in Acts of the day of Pentecost, which basically is the, we'll call it the first push or the push off, like a rocket taking off with so much force that it just everywhere people went people were hearing the gospel and they were being, for the most part, gripped by it. Like I said, two camps of people, those that heard received, those that ridiculed and rejected. But if you start watching what happens with church history, very early on corruption creeps in. Very early on we are seeing a church that needs to get back on track. We go through the dark and middle ages in church history. And it took getting to, there were several men along the way. But Wycliffe, who is called the morning star of the Reformation, and then ultimately people that would come after him, like Martin Luther, who basically said, you're, going, you're all going the wrong way, and we need to right the track, go back to the way we ought to be celebrating Christ. So it doesn't take long. So if you look at even, we, we had a, an exhibit here, and I think we still have it up on our website, of Martin Luther's attempt, if you will, his 95 thesis, all the things that happened, but look where we are now. If that happened in 1520, 1521, in that window where we are now, we have people being called Protestants because they protested and we are, say, 500 plus years removed from that, do we even look, hear me out, do we even look like Protestants anymore? That's the honesty we have to have in the church. Because what was the reason for protesting? The protest was against the church's gone off the rails ideals on selling salvation through indulgences, all the corruption, so it's needful for us, if we are going to survive and stay as a thriving body, it's important for us to stay the course. And somebody might say, well, well what do you do about it? Because if things can happen this quickly, you go to church history, you start, for example, the Church of Corinth. That is a corrective letter to a church that had already gone off the rails in such a short time of its founding. And here we are, 
I'll give you a, probably the prime example that you can all relate to. Does this country, I'm not talking about our dress or our speech, does this country look like 1776? No, it looks like, I'm sorry, it looks like it never knew 1776. And if we can forget that quickly, why that, we'll call it that specific period in history where the people living in this country said, we've had enough, to get back to why people came to this country in the first place. But it's so easy for people to slip, and it's even easier in religion. The easiest thing to do, if you're not actually having a relationship with Christ, it's the easiest thing for you to do, to be too tired, to be too unalert, to be too unaware, to be too uneducated, and nobody cares about that because guess what? Christianity especially has been so marginalized in America, not by you, by the way. You didn't do it. It started with the media. It started with the government taking prayer out of school. It started with all this. So when you start to see how quickly erosion happens from the faith, from the faith of the founding fathers, from the Bible, that's a, that's a word of caution to say, check yourself. Check yourself, as Paul said, to see that you are still in the faith. So it is imperative to not just look at this admonition that says, hey, caution, but to be careful to not act like that's a word for somebody else because it's a word for each and every one of us. I want you to think about this before I get into the message because I haven't even gotten to where I want to be to start my message, but I want you to think about this. Where would this country be? Just process for about Two seconds here. Where would this country be if we kept on the course of making sure that our children, let's just say they pledged allegiance to the flag, why did we remove that? Why did we stop that? Or we used to have prayer. I get it. There are people who have different practices. But again, instead of addressing that we need to be able to accommodate those people who actually do want to pray. We just said, oh, we're going to eliminate it altogether because it's not fair to the other people. Well, then don't put your kid in a Christian school. How's that for novel? You know, you know what you're getting when you go in there, right? Now, you have to forgive me because a lot of this editorial is actually important for us to understand what Paul is saying in Romans 9, 10, and 11 to his kinsmen, to his brothers, his brethren, to Israel, all Israel, and then right down specifically to the Jew. Check yourself. The Jew can't see it because they're blinded, their, their ears are covered up, they can't, as the prophet Isaiah was told, as repeated by our Lord, they cannot at this moment hear, receive, and be converted. And by the way, if there are people along the way, which there have been plenty of Jewish converts through, well, we'll talk about maybe the last... 1900 years or whatever that is. There have been plenty of Jewish converts. Those are the people, if you read their stories and read their lives, that, that is where you actually see God reaching in to the stream of that person being usually steeped in a concept or a belief that you couldn't shake it out of them, and somehow God opens their eyes. I don't, don't ask me how that works, but somehow that's the way it is. So we also have to be mindful, as I said to our Jewish brothers and sisters, they'll have their time. In the meantime, God said, you guys keep doing what you're doing. I'm leaving you over here. I'm going to turn my attention to the Gentiles. And then here we are. Part of what's, what Paul says, with obviously the help of the Spirit, is that the church of Jesus Christ should be making our brethren over there a little bit envious and jealous. But ask yourself the question, do we look like anything that should be envied? I don't think so. We can't even stick together. See, this is a lot of this, of what I'm talking about, spills over into different positions and different places in our lives. We have difficulty banding together as a people. Okay, Just, again, it's a super big problem. 
within the body of Christ. I'm not even talking about being an American. That's another different problem. Just banding together in the body of Christ. You know how problematic that is? What it used to be, where people could actually sit down together, and even though we have different opinions, I'm not here to try, if somebody came in and said, I am of this particular belief system. I'm not here. It's not my job to try and fix you, convert you, write you. You do your thing. And if God wants you, he's going to reach down into that stubborn, darkened container and will begin a process that I can't do. He can use people, but people don't do it. He does it. So what am I saying? If God is still God doing what only God can do, then it's time for the Church of Jesus Christ to humble itself, to get back on track, to get back to, when I say agreement, I'm not talking about, I've said this before, I'm not talking about, well, the Baptists say sprinkle, and these people over there say dunk, and these people say somewhere in the middle. I'm not talking about that. I call that the absolute minutia that is probably in the bigger picture very irrelevant that people argue over. I'll tell you what is a big thing. I mentioned this last week when I traveled in the institutions. This is where I found this to be so out there, the Jesus only movement, that there is no triune God, that there is no God the Father, there is no Holy Spirit, there's only Jesus. I'm sorry, what set of eyeballs did you get that you would interpret that that way when clearly John 14, 15, 16, talk about God sending the Holy Spirit. Jesus must go away so the Spirit can come. And when Jesus prays to the Father, he, he, these people would like to make Jesus as somebody who's got maybe a multiple personality disorder, not one part of the triune God. And it's very, all of this happens very easily. Somebody comes on the stage of history and time comes up with the most preposterous and ridiculous ideas that get traction out in mainstream society, like Jesus and Mary Magdalene were a couple and they had children, only to destroy. Is that in this book? Well, let's just add it. It'll be more interesting, right? Like every year, the things that we are, are projected that are not in this book, projected onto this book, project to, onto us as a people, that doesn't exist here, I'm sorry. So it does require being vigilant. And if people are not savvy enough to see where we are, we are right back at a very crucial point, both for the Church of Jesus Christ, for the country, for our lives. So you could say Romans 9, 10, and 11 actually has something in it for us today, not just to understand about the Jews or the Gentiles, but to understand that in a moment of complacency, in a moment of I'm tired and I don't really feel like going or worshiping or praying or reading or studying, things begin to come apart. Will it, will it come apart in one day? No, but it's like a habit. You know, people who like to, for example, eat, they don't eat, they don't eat McDonald's, they, eat, they don't eat junk food. And you say, one day I, I have some convenience. Is that gonna kill you one day? No. But if that becomes the staple of your diet, uh, what do you think? Huh? All right. No need to argue that point. <laughs> Thank you. So we need to take a page from the children of Israel and recognize if God, who granted them all of these amazing miracles to see with their own eyes, granted them, giving them the prescribed way of worship, did all of this for them, put up with their obstinate, hard-headed, rebellious ways for so long until he had enough. And we can say, wow, that's a very gracious God, very merciful, very forgiving. But make no mistake, the same God that told the children of Israel after how many generations, even though he kept promising and he kept promising, look where we're at right now in the teaching shows you that God can have enough. Now, luckily, we don't serve a God who's persnickety and uh, on a whim says, I've, I've had it. <laughs> Presses the button of you're gone. The, the, uh, 
God's version of the nuclear button, all right? No. Thank God we don't have a, we're not serving a God like that. But it is important for us to recognize every great movement, every, think about this, every movement that has happened in this country. You know, people talk about Azusa Street. Now, whether, I'm not, I am nobody's judge here, whether that all was real, whether some of it was real and not real, I don't know, I can't tell you, okay? If you don't know what that is, look it up in your own time. There's a, an outpouring of Pentecostal kind of charismatic flow. But every movement usually will fizzle out. It's a response to something. There's usually a felt need or a sense of urgency that brings about something that then when the need has been met, it fizzles out. So take a look at even the revivals that happened in this country. At what time were they happening? At a time where people were trying to get something to hold on to, all right? If you look at between World War I and World War II, we had the greatest thrust in Christendom in this country, aside from the first pilgrims and that history prior to it. So it's important to understand even this movement, if people don't get it in their head to be vigilant, to stay by the stuff, to not let go of the plow, if you want to put it that way, it's very easy for anything to fizzle out. And unless people are vigilant and understand what the cost of letting go is, I'll tell you what the cost of letting go of your Christian faith in America is. For people who do not have any faith, they are the people walking around searching for a God of their own making, something to hold on to, and whether that comes in the form of government, of science, of climate, whatever it is that they can hold on to that, that can be their, their salvation, but it's not the salvation we have in Christ. This is the problem. When the mooring goes away and people are no longer hanging on to the rock that is greater than I, when people are no longer paying attention to this book the way we should, listen to me. When I say the words conduct our lives, it doesn't mean checkbox. It means I've read what God has in mind for me, and I'm praying that he will help me to bring all of that come to pass. I don't make it happen. He helps me inside through the help of the Spirit. So with all of this said, we need to pay attention. And if you're wondering, because all of this applies in a universal perspective, if you're wondering, yeah, make the same application to whatever happened to our educational system, to our government, to our justice system. You, you apply it all, all over the place, and you'll see the same thing. The minute we start making adjustments, and I'm going to go there right now, because why not? <laughs> Listen, I said this, I've been saying this for a long time. There's not just a war on men in this country. If you think it's just a war on men, you've been wearing dark glasses for a time. It's a war on how to tear down and tear apart the American fabric to separate people to make the greatest divide ever seen so that you can hate your neighbor. What does that represent? Somebody who's not even in this book, somebody in this book is going to say, I am not even going there to judge a person by the color of their skin or by their income or their social standing, which is all designed to pit you against somebody you would never even contemplate thinking is an enemy my fellow American, my neighbor, my brothers, my sisters. So what I'm saying to you, it takes vigilance. And you might say, well, you just drifted off track. No, I didn't, because it applies to everything. But at the foundation of it all, our faith. You lose this, my friends, you're lost. And you could say, well, I made it just fine without him thus far. Well, okay, try, try that out. T come back and tell me how it worked out for you. So, what are we to do? The first thing I would say to you that is very important is to stay in the Word. And staying in the Word should never be seen as an arduous task. You either love digging in this book, you either love looking at 
matching up things, fact-finding, digging, or you don't. And there's nothing in between. Again, two types of people here. You stay in the word. You stay with the word. So being in the word is I read, I study, I listen to teaching. With the word, I order my life as though the word himself is with me. And last but not least, I treat the church of Jesus Christ, so long as you have a pastor, I'm not just speaking of myself, so long as you have a pastor that wants to teach, which is what a pastor should be doing, I order my life according to the teaching that I receive. That doesn't mean that I'm going to do as works. It means that I'm going to order my life and say, okay, God, you said your word is a light under my feet. I'm going to walk that way. Now, I may end up walking in darkness for a time. That's part of the valley of life that happens to us. But you begin there. Somebody who says, I want to order my life according to God's purposes, but never opens the book and never studies it and says, but I'm a Christian. I'm a good person. I do good things. Those good things will take you to hell if you don't have a relationship with Christ. And you could say, oh, I don't like that. Well, I've just spent weeks telling you what Paul spells out abundantly and with great simplicity. We are saved by grace, not by works. So you can't ever get in your mind that somehow you are able to do something for yourself when it comes to the salvation department. So if you are looking at the word this way, I think that will help because there's something else that comes in, and that is spiritual pride. Now, you might say, well, I, Pastor, I don't have any spiritual pride. I don't, I, don't, I don't operate like that. Okay, we know what happens in the Bible. You've got two people juxtaposed, the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee, he's gone in to pray, and I thank my God I'm not like him. Tell the truth. Be honest. If you ever read that, and so that's repulsive, but then turned around and out of your mouth said, boy, I'm sure glad I don't do that, or I'm not part of that. Or We all have done that. The point is showing us that there is a little pharisaical mindset inside each and every one of us to guard against it. You look to the publican, who basically is just grateful that God would look upon him as the sinner that he is. Be merciful to me. So I think if we're reading Paul's writing with that same caution, spiritual pride can creep up on us. We guard against it by remembering salvation is by grace alone. Neither one, neither Jew nor Gentile, deserve salvation. That's the other thing when people get into this entitlement mode. Well, I'm, a, I'm part of the chosen people. And again, I'm not going to go down that pathway. I think I've said it enough. Do not limit the concept of chosen people to simply the Jewish people that our Bible, old and new, show abundantly clear that there is not one group of people in this day and age except for those people whom God has chosen to open their eyes so that they can see, hear, and receive Jesus Christ. Now... When, if you think about it, even what I just said can be verified or confirmed from the Old Testament. What did Moses tell the children of Israel? He said, God didn't choose you because you were so numerous, numerous in, in the volume of people that you were. But no, in fact, God chose you because you were the fewest. He basically is trying to say the fewest or even some have translated that as the basest to put his love upon them. See, we, we tend to just rewrite what's not even there. Like, well, they were chosen because they, they, they were something special. No. They became special in God's eyes because he chose them. But they do not, and they are not, the singular chosen people. This, again, comes back to people trying to paint a certain picture, which is error. And text out of context, by and large, is what we're looking at now. In the text, I want to talk about a couple of things here. In the text of Romans 11, um, Paul mentions a couple of things here. So 
at 11.13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation then, which are my flesh, and might save some of them. Now I want you to really remember something, because there's, there's something that everybody seems to want to fight over. What does he say here? That he might save some of them. And then later we're going to read where he says that all Israel should be saved. And so all Israel shall be saved. Do not make the mistake of not reading everything that he said because he doesn't think they'll all be saved, okay? Specifically when he says might save some of them and has repeatedly talked about God's prerogative between using the image of Jacob and Esau or any other providential way God chose, okay? So that's one. And then he goes on to say, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. That's a mouthful right there, because he's going to talk about branches. Verse 17, and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. It's as if, and this is something that we all need to understand and take hold of, because there's a whole bunch of interpretations that I've read, seen, and heard, and none of them are right. Who came first? God chose, he called Abram, and that line that descends from Abram, where he has Isaac and Jacob, that whole line that descends, that brings about the children of Israel. And so we have to look at our position, even though we have a new covenant, we are people of the New Testament, but we must look at history and recognize that they, these people, the children of Israel specifically, I'm now not talking about Jewish people, the children of Israel, which makes up all of those tribes all combined. When God is talking about the branches through Paul broken off, and thou being a wild, wild olive tree were grafted in, do not make the mistake of thinking that that imagery suggests just by mere grafting in that we are not receiving sustenance from the tree itself. And that sustenance would come first in the form of the Old Testament because you cannot read the New Testament and say, well, I don't need the Old Testament. So we are still getting, if you want to call it nutrition, part. let's go with the tree thing. We're still getting sap, vital energy, nutrition, whatever it is that you want to call it from this part of the old or the original. And people say, well, I, don't, I only need to read the New Testament, you think? So that's one. And then when he talks about this wild olive tree, now there's some difficulty in what he does here. And the reason why is because he's using concepts that appear in Scripture. Remember, he's calling, he says, wild, grafted on, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. So there are references, for example, in Jeremiah 11. If you want to take a look with me. because it's very easy to get some of this stuff muddled. So Jeremiah 11, actually, I think I have time. I might read to where I need to get to. Um, if you have a Bible like mine, actually the header over chapter Jeremiah 11 says the broken covenant. The word of... The, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, 
which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even to this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did not do them. As the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, when after other gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape, and though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then, then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah. According to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars to them, to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry of prayer for them, for I will not hear them in, a, in the time they cry unto me in their trouble. I'm almost getting to the place I want you to see why this is needful for us to read this. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. Here is what I want you to see. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. He hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. You tell me where you could read something that was written by the prophet before the fall and demise of Judah that gives this great clarity, the branches are broken. You tell me that all of what Paul is saying is Paul's idea, that God didn't have this, see this, know this centuries or decades earlier, because he did. So he uses the image of the green olive tree here. And then there is another, another reference, which I believe is in Hosea. If you want to turn there, I think it's towards the end of the book. Yep. So in Hosea 14, Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord, say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously, so we will render the calves of our lips. Asher will not save us, we will not ride upon horses, Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. And I will be as the dew unto Israel, he shall grow as the lily cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. There is that key word right there. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. That tells you, even in the day of this writing, God could foresee the future in a prophetic voice from the pen or the mouth of Hosea to make us understand the branches shall spread, the beauty as the olive tree, in other words, and they shall return. So if anybody is confused here about Paul's version of what he's talking about, this olive tree, it is a little bit confusing, except he's saying this imagery 
has been there from the beginning. God used the, the, the imagery of the olive tree, of the vine, of the branches. It's, it's everywhere. The vineyard. These are everywhere, but specifically these references, which I'm trying to say are not an accident. So if the original branches were broken off because of unbelief, because they would not, could not, whatever. The admonition to us is you better not get puffed up with pride to say, well, I, I'm, I made it in, I'm good. Have you ever meet people that gloat? Have you ever met anybody in the body of Christ, a Christian brother or sister that gloated? Either, well, I'm, I'm saved, I know where I'm going, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you now? <laughs> okay. So he's basically telling us in this 11th chapter, be careful because if God would cut off or not spare the natural branches, how much war more or how much worse for those who can understand all of this and yet, if you're reading this, kind of go back in complacency or say it's not that urgent or it's not that important. It is. This is the other thing, if I can just take a little sidebar here. You know how many churches in America do not teach church history at all, ever? This is a mistake. This is a terrible mistake. You might say, well, but people want to hear feel-good messages that, you know, when you leave, you're like, oh, I was electrified. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that lasted about 10 minutes until you're in your car and somebody cuts you off, and then you're not so electrified anymore, okay? <laughs> but if you have received knowledge of some kind, even if it's some small thing, you remember the late Dr. Gene Scott used to tell the story of the kid in school, went to Sunday school, right? And the lesson was out of um, you know, one of the Psalms, to not be afraid. And when the parent asked the kid, what'd you learn today? I ain't scared, right? That was the, the takeaway. The, the kid actually got what was being said in, in the Bible class. I ain't scared. No, it's, not, it's not a perfect quote, but the kid got the message. That's what we are going for, getting the takeaway for this is to stop treating the church like anything but what it is, the church of Jesus Christ and its design, which Paul has repeated in many different places, to conform us to the image and likeness of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith, what? That is in Christ. That we may look unto him who is the author and finisher of our faith. That we may... Live our lives. That's not living your life as some monastic weirdo that's trapped in this, I got to stay in this box. But actually, you find out once you start living by this word, it's almost like the doors are open. True freedom is experienced because you realize the world that like to tell you that you're wasting your time, that you're doing it wrong, that you could be doing something else this Sunday morning, you could be watching the game on TV, you could be Stuffing your face with McDonald's. I don't know, okay? I'm just, just saying, all right? But to the person who says uniquely, this is my time, this is my appointment. If you want to put it like that, this is my appointment. I have to make an appointment. I hate to say it like this, but I've got to make an appointment with God. You know, you have a doctor's appointment. You, you, you have an appointment. You go to that appointment. Except that's because you have to. This should be because you desire or want to. Too much of what is done today in churches does not carry with it the concept of growth. And how do you grow? You don't grow by somebody rubbing the back. You grow by repetition of certain things that create spiritual muscles. You're not going to get that without the teaching that comes from this book. So, as I said, very, very important for us to make sure we guard and we stay vigilant. Now, I want to get back to the text real quickly because I'm running out of time here. So as he says about us being grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If you actually get that, that's like telling you, where does the source come from? Don't think you generate it on your own. You've got to be plugged in somewhere. It's just like faith. You've got to be plugged into the power source that gives you the ability. 
Don't think you do it on your own. You do not. That will then say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear, for God spared not the natural branches. Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. And I like that. In one mouthful, the goodness and the severity. And what I like about, again, Paul's writing is there's a lot in here, but there are things that just, if you had nothing else and you just received that, the goodness of God and the severity of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I think about that, if I just didn't know anything about God, which side of that receiving end would I want to be on? Hmm. Let me think for a little bit. Hmm. Got any suggestions here? Goodness or severity? I don't know about you. So, he says, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. And this is what I'm saying. Otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft in them, to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted in on their own? So if you see what he's doing, it's almost as though he's saying, not just, I'll be back, but there are those that can receive, they will be grafted in. And that's why when I hear people talking about either the fate or the future of Jews and Judaism, if they're not studying this, you're going to hear all kinds of crazy things. But the reality is God, as I've said before, has a plan. And he's pretty good at making his word come to pass. So... Let me keep going. He says, For I should not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. The mystery? The mystery of salvation. The mystery that Christ, that God sent his only begotten son, that these people would not listen, that he would turn his face towards the Gentiles, that we would receive all of that. If you really think about it, it is a mystery. This whole book not mystery as in spooky or weird, but just absolutely mind-blowing if you think about it. And he says, but I wouldn't have you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that the blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. Again, don't read this and go, yeah, and everybody's going to get saved, including the devil. That was a preacher across town who, when he started preaching that, everybody left the church. You're like, no, even if I don't know what you're talking about, I do not believe that is in the Bible. And they all left. <laughs> Rightly so, by the way. And so when he says, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, this is also equally interesting because he's got a quote here out of Isaiah 59, 20. And if, I won't read it now, but if you go and you read that in your own time, it's, it's brilliant that he could quote these, we'll call them, they are the remas of God, put them in the right place. And for us, we can go back and start digging at the whole context of that passage, which equally is illuminating if you, if you do that in your own time. But as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without recall, not repentance, but without recall. And that, by the way, should be understood more along the lines of when God calls somebody, when he chooses somebody, he is not going, oh, shoot, why did I call them? <laughs> what the heck was I thinking when I... That... And on the flip side, for us, once we've been touched by God, it's important for us to stay alert and eyes focused on him. So this actually goes both ways. You can take this both ways. For as ye in time past 
have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And now begins for the next three or so verses a type of doxology, a kind of and glory to God that you're like this, that he's celebrating when he says, oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? And that's, I want to just kind of point you at something to look at. We can say we have the mind of Christ, but who hath known the mind of the Lord to understand all of what's happened in the past, had a purpose, what's going on in the present has a purpose, and what is yet to happen in the future has a purpose. But only God can know this. So when people say, oh, yeah, we have the Bible, we have a written word that gives us the template of events that must unfold, but no one can say, I have this down perfectly. I know everything that's going to happen as it will happen because that is the mystery, for example, of the children of Israel. Had you and I not had all the books, maybe just the Pentateuch, we'd be saying, wow, these children of Israel, they did good. First five books of the Bible. We don't know anything except God chose them and they did pretty good and they made out pretty good. You wouldn't know the rest of it. But the rest of it doesn't end too well right now, temporarily. So he's saying, who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, and to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now what's really kind of crazy is that he goes from this 11th chapter, goes, when he goes into the 12th, which most of you are very familiar with, it's a way of saying to present yourself, do not be like these people that would not fully surrender. Do not be like these people that said, yes, God, we think you're pretty amazing, while they basically did, <laughs> you know, okay, and did something else. So the 12th chapter, don't, there was no chapter and verse. Imagine the flow of, and you are to present yourself a living sacrifice. In other words, you Gentile listeners, don't make the same mistake. It's very easy to make that mistake. So what I want to tell you, and I'm going to try and bring this to a conclusion, you've got this mass multitude having come under the shade of this olive tree. So God says there's still plenty of room left. And God also says, I can cut some of the branches out that I grafted in. So, with that being said, I think it's important to understand why all of this kind of put together tells you that not only does God have a plan for our Jewish brothers and sisters, God has a plan for Israel, all Israel, which, comprise, which should be comprised of Jew and non-Jew alike. Please don't get into this minutia. Is Paul talking about when he mentions Israel? Is he talking about the Gentiles? Is he talking about this because I've explained about all the tribes. You're, you actually have a good mix of, we'll call it north and south, blended into now New Testament times. And why do I say that? Because on the day of Pentecost, you could see all the array of people that were gathered there. It's all different people. So I can say, if we have looked at this properly, I want you to go with me to one more place in the Old Testament. Kind of strange, I think I would finish in the New Testament, but I'm going to finish in the Old. I want you to see something. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, which really should begin at verse 27, but I only want to read a few verses starting at verse 31. So Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, 
every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. So it's as if, you know, when you read the Old Testament, a lot of times you read a passage like that, but you read it at the end of everything we've studied, and now it really has flesh and blood on it when he says, I'll make a new covenant, put it in your inward parts. You can see that God not only has a plan, but he has the way that he will accomplish this. So for all those people that say, well, but, you know, we still, we still don't know about, you know, when is Christ going to return, and we still don't know these things. And that. Listen, there is enough information in here if you're studying this book to tell you almost God said, no one knows the season or the day or the hour, but there are enough things lined up in there that if somebody is looking, there are world events that must take place which have not yet happened. There is, as I said last week, there must come an individual who will speak great words, words of peace, will perform great miracles. People will think, this is God in the flesh and they will be deceived because it will be the false prophet and the antichrist. A whole series of events that must unfold which have not yet happened. So for all those people saying, well, is this the end? Is the end near? Let me just tell you something. And I know this maybe doesn't sit right with a lot of people, but God doesn't have to tell you every answer. You know what he has to make sure of? That you understood what your part of the mission was. Your part of the mission wasn't to solve the whole puzzle and look, it matches the box. Your part was to trust him and take him at his word. Your part was to exercise faith that when he said he'd do a thing, he'd do it. That's your part and mine. We don't get to tell God when, how, why. He knows all of that. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? The Lord does. So my part and your part is to take him at his word and trust him. I think with great confidence I can say this. If God had such mercy and such patience and such long-suffering to these people over such a great amount of time, maybe God will be as merciful and as compassionate to look upon we, and specifically I'm talking about the church in America, to give us the time to process how we have ill-treated, mistreated, and even blasphemed God by not staying by the stuff. God's word is sufficient. We don't need to add. We don't need modern ideology. We don't need people to come in and say, but what about science? And what about these other things? I'm not saying we don't need them. But if we're people of the book, we should be people who are in the book trying to know everything that we can about what God said through the ages until the ages to come, until the time of the Gentiles, which is, we are in that time, is fulfilled. Until that time, I pray that God gives me the breath in my lungs to keep standing here and telling you about God's grace, God's love, God's favor, and above all, the fact that God is not finished with us. He still has lots of work to do, and I'm the first person to say, work in progress. Keep it going, God, because I'm not wanting to be conformed to the world. I'm looking to be conformed to the image and likeness of your dear and precious son, Jesus Christ. That is my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.